All eyes are on Washington as the new Congress convenes for the first session of 2023. The vein in my forehead is already popping, as I imagine how many times the phrase Hunter Biden's laptop will be used in the new GOP-controlled House. But while everyone is focusing on America's governing shenanigans, Israel just swore in what many are calling the country's most right-wing government ever, led once again by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And if you think Bibi is right-wing or extreme, some of his new coalition colleagues, some of those new Israeli government ministers, make our own House GOP caucus look like a UC Berkeley a cappella group. Case in point, Itmar Ben Gavir, who we've told you about before, he was appointed National Security Minister. Ben Gavir is a student of the late anti Arab rabbi Mir Kahana, who once called for a ban on Jewish Arab intermarriage and founded a political party that the United States once designated as a terror organization. Ben Gavir, who lives in a settlement in the occupied territories, was convicted in a Jerusalem court of incitement to racism and supporting a terrorist organization back in 2007. He's now in charge of the Israeli police forces that monitor Jerusalem's holy sites. He's also been known to show off a photo of Baruch Goldstein in his home, the American Israeli who opened fire in a West Bank mosque, massacring 29 Palestinians. And Ben Gavir is not treading carefully. On Tuesday, just days after taking office, he provocatively visited a very sensitive holy site in Jerusalem, angering Palestinian and Arab leaders. Also appointed to the new Israeli government, Bezal El Smotrich, the new finance minister. Smotrich, like Ben Gavir, lives in an illegal settlement. He supports the Israeli annexation of the occupied West Bank. But Smotrich has also voiced support for evicting Palestinians from that area and demolishing their homes. Perhaps even more shockingly, he once advocated for segregating maternity wards, tweeting, Arabs are my enemies and that's why I don't enjoy being next to them. And then there's Avi Maoz, who will become a deputy minister in charge of the curriculum at some Israeli schools. Maoz is openly homophobic, calling same-sex relationships deviant and abnormal, while his party's website supports gay conversion therapy and objects to women serving in the military. So where does that leave the United States government, which is, of course, a government that sends billions of dollars in aid to Israel? U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the United States will focus on policies, not personalities, when it comes to Israel. But that's a bit of a cop-out, given the new far-right personalities are deciding the new far-right policies. The new Israeli government, for example, will be taking a different stance than the previous government when it comes to the war in Ukraine. That's right. New Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen said Monday that on the issue of Russia and Ukraine, we will do one thing for sure, speak less in public. This is a break from Cohen's predecessor, Yair Lapid, who condemned Russia's war on Ukraine and said that Putin's army had committed war crimes. Russia indeed seems happy about Israel's new governing coalition, with President Putin celebrating Netanyahu's return and hoping for Russian-Israeli cooperation in all areas for the benefit of our peoples. 2023 may be a new year, but unfortunately it looks like we will be watching the same old spread of far-right ideology. Joining me now, Peter Beinart, Jewish Currents editor-at-large, author of the Beinart Notebook on Substack, and an MSNBC political analyst. Peter, Happy New Year. Thanks for coming back on the show. Uh, maybe you're not that happy about Israel's new far-right government. Which members of that coalition are you most worried about, concerned about, shocked by? Well, you know, although people like Itamar Ben Gavir and um, uh, Betzalel Smotrich get all the attention, one of the things that they do by being so extreme is they kind of normalize Benjamin Netanyahu and make ah, us think of point. him as actually someone who supports liberal democracy. It, it's it's really important to remember that for his entire political career, Benjamin Netanyahu has been emphatically, fervently supportive of Israel controlling and entrenching its control over millions and millions of Palestinians who live under the control of a state they can't vote for, they can't be citizens of, who live under a different legal system than their Jewish neighbors, in which they lack the most basic rights, like free movement. They need the Israeli military's permission to travel around. And so this is the baseline, right? Now, we're talking about people who are more racist than this, but this is yeah. what Benjamin Netanyahu believes and has always believed. It's such a good point you make. Uh, it's almost like here in the U.S., 
when we have Donald Trump and we say, well, Ron DeSantis isn't Donald Trump. He's a right. more moderate right. Republican. When by any objective standard, Ron DeSantis is a far-right Republican. But Trump makes him uh, look a little bit more normal. Uh, let's talk about Israelis' politics and Israel's shift to the far-right in recent years. We talk a lot about the American shift to the right. How did Israel go even beyond uh, where our own Republican Party has gone here in the U.S.? I feel like a lot of people in America haven't been paying attention, weren't paying attention to what was going on uh, in Israeli society, in Israeli politics. A lot of Democrats in America still act as if the country is some sort of liberal democracy and that we have shared values with the people in power in Israel when we clearly don't. Right. I mean, the first thing to remember always when one starts these conversations is that most of the Palestinians under Israeli control can't vote. There are Palestinian citizens of Israel, perhaps a couple million of them, and they can vote. But the Palestinians, the three million in the West Bank, the two million in Gaza, they cannot vote. So when you talk about this election of this far-right government, it's not representing the will of all the people under Israeli control. It's representing an electorate in which most Palestinians can't participate. So the question is, why have Jewish Israelis, the ones who can vote, move to the right. Partly it's demography, that younger Israeli Jews are more religious. And um, as with white Americans in the United States, people who are more religious tend to be more politically conservative. There was also a backlash in Israel as a result of the Second Intifada in the early years of this century, that a narrative was created that Israel, that the Palestinians would never make any peace agreement, so yes. why was it worth even trying? But the third element is really important, and that has to do with the fact that Israel has paid no price for this movement. One of the reasons Benjamin Netanyahu and his allies have been so sex successful is they've told Israeli Jews, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can, can annex, you can control the West Bank more and more entrenched, destroy the two-state solution, and you will pay no price with the United States. And indeed, that is exactly the message the Biden administration is still telling, which is why they can maintain their control and power so easily. You mentioned normalization a moment ago. It's not just uh, normalizing Netanyahu in relation to these more far-right members of his own coalition. It's also making previous governments look more moderate than they were. We saw a surge in violence in the occupied West Bank last year with around 80 Palestinians killed. Uh, with these new ultra-nationalist leaders in charge of the police force and the zoning laws, on the one hand, you could argue the situation is going to deteriorate further. On the other hand, it's worth pointing out that the previous more moderate government killed more Palestinians in the West Bank than in any previous year on record. Yes, or the demolishing of, of, of the homes of thousands of people in a place called Masafar Yata, where people have been accused of no crime whatsoever. They just happen not to be citizens, and so the Israeli government can destroy their homes when it's convenient because it wants to build a military base there, rendering thousands of people homeless. This was done under the good guys, right, under Yair Lapid and the supposedly moderate government. But I think what's going to happen now is that Palestinians will become even more desperate because the pace of settlement growth and of the demolishing of Palestinian homes will grow even more f faster, and there will be more Palestinians who resist violently. And in response to that, and, and that resistance will lead Israel to crack down even further. And I think we could be headed towards even a mass uprising, which would lead to terrible death, uh, both among Palestinians and Israeli Jews. I mean, it sounds cynical sometimes, but can you blame Palestinians in particular for looking at Israeli governments, new Israeli governments, and saying, meet the new boss, same as the old boss? No, I absolutely. For Palestinians, um, the, the, this doesn't make a huge amount of difference. The, the fundamental thing is that Palestinians see no hope for gaining basic rights. One of the reasons they see no hope is they're getting no support even from a democratic administration and in the United States. And from this is a point Martin Luther King made again and again and again and again. If you want to understand where the violence comes from among people who lack basic rights, it comes from the desperation they feel at not being able to get their rights peacefully and legally. And that is where Israel is pushing the situation. And that is why I fear we're headed for a more and more violent future in which people like Itamar Ben-Gavir and Betzalel Smotrich, let's be clear, who have in the past proposed mass expulsion of Palestinians, their voices go stronger. Let's talk uh, geopolitics. Let's talk Israel's new government and its impact on the world. We're seeing signs that Russia and Israel want increased cooperation. Netanyahu has always had a close relationship with Putin. Now you have, uh, you know, ministers, the new foreign minister suggesting, you know, we'll stay out of the Ukraine stuff. How should the U.S. counteract 
any kind of budding alliance between Israel and Russia? And how should it deal with one of its closest allies, who we give billions of dollars to, undermining Western foreign policy, Western security strategy? It's interesting. If I had to guess, I would guess the Biden administration will be tougher on the Israeli government on this question, on the question of its relationship yes, with Russia, than it will be on anything it does with the Palestinians. This was the way. This was the pattern in the Cold War. The U.S. was tougher on 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 Israel when it deviated from the U.S. Cold War policy than for anything it did vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian human rights. Israel wants a good relationship with Russia because. It has a de facto agreement with Russia in Syria that Israel can bomb in Syria against Hezbollah targets and the Russian military, with Russia, which controls the skies there, will let them do that. That's why Israel wants to do this. But I suspect the Biden administration will twist their arm a bit on this. Last question, Peter. A remarkable return to office for Benjamin Netanyahu, now the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. He was in the middle of a corruption trial before he won this latest election. I feel like Donald Trump might be looking to Netanyahu as a bit of a role model. You could be on trial for crimes and still get back into office, it seems. Yes, that's true. And part of the bargain that Netanyahu made, the reason he was part of the reason he went into power with these extreme right wing figures is that they were promising, in the way that some other centrist Israelis wouldn't, that they would pass the law that would basically end or at least, uh, you know, ameliorate the corruption trial. So that's what they have kind of hanging over him. And yes, it's quite similar to the deal you see with Donald Trump. Donald Trump doesn't have really core convictions. But what his core convictions are is he wants to be able to violate the law with impunity and enrich himself. And so he makes alliances with hard right ideologues who will allow him to do that.